Hello, hello. All right, thank you. Well, my talk is a token non-flat earth presentation to round out the day, although it does segue quite well out of Karen's. Uh, I am totally on board with everything that's been discussed today, but I'm very far from an expert on these points, so I prefer to stick with what I know well. Uh, but I do just want to uh, relate a quick anecdote before I get into the main material. When I was preparing the uh, writing of my book, Musical Truth Volume 1, which I put out in early 2016, the writing process had occurred through 2014 and 2015. During that time, the issue of the idea that we might not live on a spinning ball hurtling through the infinite vacuum of space after all had come across my radar. And like many people, initially I scoffed at it, I thought it was ridiculous, I just wanted to push it away, but it kept on coming back. And every time it kept bouncing back to me, I decided to uh, look into it a little bit further and eventually I got sold on the whole thing. But by the time I was fully convinced that we had been lied to about the cosmology of where we live, the uh, manuscript of my book had gone off to be typeset. And I realised that in the wordage, it was absolutely littered with the phrase global. And so I recalled it, and I changed every reference to global to worldwide, and then put it out there. And I feel very happy that I did. <laughs> there is actually a common thread running between uh, everything we've heard about today and what I'm about to present, and that is duplicity and deception, and the fact that the public is always the last to know. So my presentation is titled The Weaponization of Sound. I'm starting with a quote from the BBC, believe it or not. I don't often quote from the BBC. They're not exactly known for being a paragon of truth and virtue. But I couldn't disagree with this statement from Susie Klein on a show which went out a couple of years ago, where she says, she, she talks about music's, music's uncanny ability to stir us up, to calm us down, to express every possible human emotion. It bypasses language and reason and aims instead directly for our souls. Uh, music can console us and it can corrupt us, inspire resistance or collusion. So she's speaking to the idea that sound and the manipulation of it, because everything in this existence is made up of sound and light frequency, as we've heard on a few occasions today. Uh, if the manipulation of sound falls into the hands of those who have malevolent intent and don't have humanity's best interests at heart, then the results can be quite devastating. This was actually a reference in a record by Kate Bush that she put out in the 80s called Experiment 4. This is the music video for it. And in the song, she talks about a military grade experiment. That's a surprise, isn't it? Which is all about using sound as a weapon. It's had many references in popular culture through the years, this subject, even in the Tintin uh, adventures by Hergé, the Belgian uh, cartoonist. So in this particular story, The Calculus Affair, Tintin and Captain Haddock discover that Professor Calculus is working on a machine designed to uh, use sound as a weapon to destroy cities. And he's, uh, it falls into the hands of these world superpowers that want to use it to destroy their enemies. Well, in actual fact, Hergé based that story on very real technology. Over on the right here, we can see uh, what he based it on, which came out of Germany during the World War II years. And there's also a reference to this type of technology in this article here from 2008. And it talks in the beginning there of higher volumes of infrasound affect the human central nervous system, causing disorientation, anxiety, panic, bowel spasms, nausea, vomiting, and eventually unconsciousness. That's what sound can do in the hands of the wrong people. You know, it's interesting because Greta Thunberg uh, forgot to mention this in her address to the United Nations last week when she's talking about these imminent threats to human health and well-being. Uh, I guess it just slipped her mind, you know. And uh, this is, by the way, the same technology which is used as the basis for the 5G rollout, which is planned for us all very soon. That is a military-grade technology based on the same sort of stuff we're talking about here. So what could possibly go wrong, right? We get into 
a real hot potato when it comes to discussion of the music industry and the ways in which it's used to manipulate the general public. And this is the issue of 432 versus 440 hertz. So musicologists and audiophiles and sound engineers will tell you that 432 is a very natural harmonic frequency for musical instruments to be pitched at. So the idea is that the A note is pitched to 432 hertz and then all the other notes in the composition fall into line accordingly. The alternative application to that is 440 hertz and this has actually been the international standard to which musical instruments and most recorded music that we get as consumers is pitched at. So these same scientists of sound will tell you that 440 is anything but a harmonic frequency and anything but a natural choice for us to be listening to music at. They will tell you that it's very discordant, it's very dissonant, it doesn't sit well with human physiology, human brain waves, and actually it creates states of anxiety and disturbance. And this has been observed many times in experiments. Now the figures here become very interesting. So 440 is the one that, according to these experts, we should be chucking out, and we should be remaining with 432. And it struck me some time back that 432 falls into place in a very fascinating cosmic sequence that we get. It's very unique in nature. It's not repeated with any other uh, sequence of numbers. And this particular sequence starts with 27, and that puts me in mind straight away of the fabled 27 Club that we get in uh, music and legend, all these artists that have passed away at the age of 27 in strange circumstances. But either way, what you do here is you double the number each time. So from 27 you get to 54, then it's 108, 216, there's the 432, then you double that to get to 864. And we see so many applications of this sequence uh, in many walks of life and in nature. So yogic schools teach that all living beings exhale and inhale 21,600 times a day. Doesn't matter where you put the zeros in this, by the way, it's the main core figures that are important. The Kali Yuga is said to last 432,000 years, being part of the Great Cycle, which itself lasts 4,320,000 years. There are 864,000 seconds in a day. 432,000 for day, 432,000 for night. So it seems this figure 432 is encoded into nature and creation itself. It becomes very interesting to take this further as well, particularly in light of you know, what we're all here for and the information that we've heard today. Now, uh, most of us probably reject these figures. 864,000 miles seems to be a rather optimistic diameter for the sun if it really is only 3,000 odd miles away. But these are the official figures which have been put out there for these luminaries. So we're told that 864,000 miles is the diameter of the sun. Then, according to many claims, the moon has a diameter of 2,160 miles. So again, it's different representations of this same sequence and the same figures. One astrological age in a precessional cycle is said to be 2,160 years. And before I got into all this stuff, and when I was still uh, a mainstream news and media believer, I was a follower of Graham Hancock. I thought he was a great author. I loved his book, Fingerprints of the Gods. In that book, I can recall that he said the Great Pyramid of Giza is a representation of the northern hemisphere of the Earth on a scale of 43,200. Then we hear that the polar diameter of Saturn is given as 108,000 kilometers, and its orbital period is said to be 10,800 days. So the point here is that I don't accept these figures, and I suspect that many or most of you don't either. Uh, they appear to be grossly fabricated, but it's very interesting that whoever did apply these figures and tell us things like the diameter of the sun is 864,000 miles, seem to have some awareness of this sequence which presents itself in nature. Uh, the 432s, the A64s, and all these different uh, you know, evocations of this sequence. 
And just to add an additional mind blower to this, I got it from Marty Leeds from listening to one of his radio shows many years ago. Marty is into gematria, applying numerical values to letters. And in this particular broadcast, he mentioned the word Jesus, which if you apply it to, uh, I think it's Jewish gematria, it comes out as 45666. Interesting last three figures, right? But he totally blew my mind by revealing that if you multiply all of these figures together, you end up with 43,200. So it suggests to me that 432 hertz is indeed something which is encoded into nature by the creator, and it is the frequency with which we should be listening to our music. Unfortunately, most people are absorbing music at the dissonant frequency of 440, and that will not be by accident. This guy is Dr. Masuro Amoto, who passed away a few years ago, but he was a Japanese scientist who looked into uh, the science of sound and the effect that uh, sound frequencies and vibrational frequencies of words have on water. This was his speciality. He would expose uh, containers of water to particular words. Now these could be words that are spoken, so you get the resonant frequency of the, the audio, or it could be a word in written form, the idea being that the word still carries the vibrational frequency signature. Uh, whether you speak it or whether it's written, it's still attached to the word. He would then freeze the water very quickly and under a microscope study the patterns that were formed in response to these words. So here's some of the results. Whenever you get a word which is charged with positive benevolent intent, you get these beautifully uh, geometric and harmonic patterns. But when you expose it to phrases like, you fall, you make me sick, evil, and stuff like this, you get all these chaotic, uh, hazardous kind of uh, patterns, which are anything but harmonic. There's a few more examples there. And some more. You make me sick, I will kill you. Doesn't produce the best results, it seems. When we look at the sonic signatures of audio recordings under an oscilloscope, we often come across what is known as a sawtooth wave, and this crops up quite often in popular music. That's how a sawtooth wave looks under a, an oscilloscope. And uh, there was this guy, William, however you pronounce that, who uh, appeared in this video interview that's available on YouTube. You can look it up there using the description at the bottom. Uh, this guy claims to have been a, a former druid working for the uh, control system, but he went over to the light side and he revealed some of the secrets of what he was into. So he talked about the sawtooth wave and he said it's a very disagreeable sound, like the sound of fingernails on a chalkboard. Uh, and he says, what I find extremely interesting is that some of the fuzz effect and these weird sounds that people like The Who and Jimi Hendrix and these early pioneers of rock music would do, a lot of that involves sawtooth waves. We get into the music of Jimi Hendrix again when we get into another aspect of uh, sound production. And this is what's known as the tritone. The tritone is an interval between notes, which is three whole tones apart. And this has long been considered to be uh, very harmful for people to absorb. In the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church apparently banned the tritone from any of the music that was being produced at the time, because they just care about us and want to help us, you know. Uh, so, so there's an example of that. It was also known as the Devil's Interval, because it was supposed to be just so dissonant and so uh, distressing for people to experience in a piece of music. Well, a very good example of the tritone, according to musicologists, would be Jimi Hendrix's Purple Haze. If you think about the opening chords to that, that is an example of a tritone in action. Uh, it's reputed to have been banned by the Catholic Church, as I said, um, and it's been greatly favoured by some of Rock's more raucous performers from the 1960s onwards. So Black Sabbath's eponymous song is said to offer another prominent showcase of the tritone, along with much of the output of Slayer. That's a surprise, isn't it? The Million Song data set, this was an archive uh, charting the progression or regression, you might say, of pop music 
between 1955 and 2010. So you had these expert analysts that were looking into the compositions of these pop songs, and they concluded that music has been getting dumber, and pop songs that have been served up to us have been more and more simplistic in their makeup, and that actually artificial intelligence algorithms are reporting what is going to make a catchy pop tune with a good hook that's going to draw people in. And the reason they've got dumber is because the attention spans of the average members of the public have been dwindling with all these other things vying for our attention. Uh, you know, the, the spans that people have to be able to concentrate on something are now down to a few seconds. So the reason pop music is now so bland is because the AI algorithms are recommending that you get more of these stupid sing-along hooks and all this to uh, keep the listeners on board for as long as possible. Another thing that we have in the modern era when it comes to the way music is served up to us is that everything is now digitally, electronically produced. <coughs> and a lot of people listen to most of their music in the form of MP3s. So the MP3 encoding process takes a much larger file which has a full frequency audio range and compresses it. And it does that to make a smaller file, which can be shared more easily, takes up less disk space. But the way this is achieved is that the process strips out aspects of the recording that it deems to be imperceptible to the human ear. So it might be a particular bass line, it might be a particular frequency. It gets rid of it, but it's, so, uh, it's done so subtly that the listener is unaware that this aspect of the recording is missing. So it strikes me that if you can strip away parts of a recording without anyone being consciously aware of it, then the opposite can be true. And you can be adding elements to a recording, you can be adding sound frequencies, and these are also totally imperceptible to the people on the receiving end of it. So it raises all kinds of questions about what's going into the music that we're now getting uh, presented with, given that it's all digital and electronic in nature. And this brings in uh, aspects of another presentation, which I did, just got a few slides from it here, Mind Control Through Electronic Dance Music. This is uh, a subject of great interest to me. Uh, in the late 80s, I was right there at the forefront of the acid house rave scene when it emerged in the UK. Got caught up in that whole thing. I was very much into the music, the clubbing scene. Never actually did the drugs. I was always too level-headed for that. I lived a sheltered life. But uh, when it comes to the music, I was very much into it. So I've come to some discoveries in recent years about what the electronic dance music scene could now be getting used for when we look at the picture long term. So the acid house rave scene, which grew up in the UK in the late 80s and then gave birth to the era of the super clubs in the 90s, to my mind, was very much a reboot and a repackaging of what had been done earlier in the 1960s with the hippie counterculture scene. So in that movement, you had new forms of music, psychedelic rock and country rock and folk rock, coming along to replace the styles that were there previously. You had a seemingly unending supply of LSD popping up everywhere at all these music festivals and hippie communes. And when you get into the research, you find that most of it got put out there by the CIA, who were directly responsible for uh, this influx of LSD. And then you had uh, all these music festivals like uh, the Monterey Pop Festival and Woodstock and Altamont and all these others, where hordes of these hippies would gather, do the drugs, listen to the music and just trip on out. Well, there's so much evidence now available to show that that whole scene, to a very large extent, occurred at the hands of military intelligence agencies who wanted to control the whole thing and steer it off in desired directions and monitor and surveil the results at every step of the way. So to my thinking, what we had in the UK 21 years later, kicking off in 1987-88 with the acid house scene, was simply a repackaging of that whole dynamic on the opposite side of the Atlantic. So this time, instead of LSD, you had the ready availability of ecstasy, 
E, MDMA, which was absolutely everywhere in those times. And there is some evidence to show that many of the pills that turned up at that time were coming out of military intelligence as well, British military intelligence this time. You had very different styles of music, electronically produced dance music, which was replacing the styles that had been there previously, and you had all these warehouse parties, open air raves, uh, free festivals, and then latterly super clubs, where all these kids would get together under the influence of the drugs, listening to this new music, and again, these situations would have been monitored and surveilled as well. So that's what I feel was going on there. Now this dude, Terence McKenna, is often revered in consciousness circles as something of a guru. Many people I know hang on his every word and you know think he's some kind of demigod in terms of the wisdom that he dispensed about plant medicines and human connectedness to uh, nature and all of this. Unfortunately, uh, there is also evidence to suggest that Terence McKenna was working for at least a time uh, in the employ of the FBI, or at least in association with the FBI. But I just want to present to you uh, an aspect of this lecture that he delivered called Evolution in London in 1992. This was right in the midst of the birth of the super club scene, which had come off the back of Acid House. So in this lecture, he said, with electronic culture, you can create shamans for the global, his word, planetary village. And this, to my mind, is the function that rock and roll played in the 60s and house music should play in the 90s. So he's making the connection there himself between these two scenes. Through emphasis in house music and rave culture on physiologically compatible rhythms, sound, properly understood, can actually change neurological states in large groups of people getting together, creating a telepathic community of bonding that hopefully would be strong enough that it would carry the vision out into the mainstream of society. <clears throat> He's just explained the dynamic that takes place at these events where you've got the combination of subliminal Im images being planted into the subconscious mind of the, the people present. You've got the mind altering uh, aspects of the drugs that are being consumed. You've got this electronically produced music and you've got this kind of hive mind mentality where all the people present at one of these raves, one of these music festivals are all kind of on the same vibe and all being exposed to the same frequencies. And we've got more of the same idea some almost 30 years later on a show that was put out by the BBC, again BBC4, it was screened in 2017 and it was talking about the cultural significance of the worldwide dance music movement. And this guy, Moby, DJ and music producer, who just happens to be descended from Herman Melville, the author of the Moby Dick novels, which is how he got his name, made this quote very similar to the McKenna one. He said, if we were sitting here 25,000 years ago, Someone might ask, what do you think is compelling those people to bang on logs and dance around a fire while lights flicker in their eyes? You also just described modern dance culture. So an anthropologist could use those same terms to describe music and dancing and hedonism 20,000 years ago or five minutes ago. He's speaking to these primal desires that exist within us as humans to dance and celebrate and... Uh, stimulate our minds artificially and he's saying you know this could have been the case thousands of years ago and what we're seeing now with the dance music scene which is massive all over the world literally in every corner of it uh, is just a modern enactment of this phenomenon that's been with us forever so looking at where the electronic dance music scene is at now and bearing in mind that it's got literally millions of dedicated followers all around the world, uh, the fan base is absolutely massive. We have all these events with all the light shows that accompany it and all the decor and stuff. It becomes interesting to look at some of the names of the very largest dance music events which take place. So we have Dream State in California. Right here in the Netherlands, Trance Nation and Luminosity are two big ones. Velvet Hypnotized, Atlantis, Spring Awakening, Awake, Dream Beach, Delirium Eternity, Electronic Family, 
Digital society, digital dreams, tomorrow world, tomorrow land, future music festival, and new horizons. So looking at these names, they all evoke ideas of altered states of consciousness, dream states, and very specifically, a transhumanist artificial intelligence smart grid internet of things reality which is now upon us we're not even marching towards it anymore because it's here so looking at names like electronic family digital society digital dreams tomorrow world this to my mind is evoking ideas of where human society is headed at the hands of the crazy psychopaths that we have in control it's revering transhumanism it's revering electronic and digital ways of doing things and artificial intelligence as really great and where the future is headed. And it's in training the young people who attend all these dance music festivals to accept technology as something that's really good, that's something that's to be embraced. So we see it here in all the, the names that are being subliminally fed into the minds of these people. And when they're under the influence of mind-altering chemicals, and they've got all these subliminal uh, sound frequencies coming through the music, and all the images coming through the decor that you get at these events, then that's some very powerful mind control at work. And just looking at the geographical spread of these events, you will notice that they are literally all over the world. We've got events here in Bali, LA, Chicago, the Netherlands, you know, every corner you could think of. These are comments from a couple of former ravers. So it's people that would be now in their middle age, but back in the day when they were young and impressionable, they used to go along to these events and they got swept up in the whole spirit of it. These comments were taken from uh, a discussion on the David Icke forum, where a bunch of you know grizzled old former ravers were reflecting on what it was they were a part of. These are some very key comments, I feel. One person said, when the music got more and more hardcore, some of it used to make me feel like it was trying to take over my mind. Not sure how to explain the feeling, but I remember being at a rave and not liking what the beat was doing. Somebody else said, I think music can be used to amplify the dimensions from which it is created. If you make music with evil thoughts, give it evil rhythms, it will produce evil vibrations. And the people that were commenting on this forum were from every corner of the earth as well. You had ravers from Australia, comparing notes with ravers from California, from Europe. Very interesting with the benefit of hindsight to think back on what these scenes may really have all been about. And also what they were preparing for, what they were leading in, which is where we're at now, in my view. Then some more comments. It's not in the beats, but in the tonal qualities of the music. If you have the wrong type of distortion, you can have odd order harmonics entering into a sound you like and are tuned into. And then somebody says, rave music is more guilty than other genres. The 303, which is the Roland 303 uh, synthesizer sampler, is a transistor-based saw and square generator. And the filters on that thing generate mostly odd order harmonics. So you get the picture. It's all about how sound frequencies wrongly handled or handled by people with the wrong kind of motives can be doing us great harm. But uh, we're getting on to the positive stuff. I want to leave things on a positive note, as I generally tend to. Just as sound can be weaponized, the reverse is a possibility, as I mentioned earlier. And this is where so much hope lies. So music as used for healing and sound frequencies for healing in the same way that they can do great harm, they can also do great good if we tap into the right frequencies and make that reconnection back to our inherent nature and our connectedness to everything else in creation. So it's said that with memory loss brought on by, by dementia, dementia, the melodies and lyrics of favorite songs are the last to go and exposure to fondly remembered music has been known to bring people out of deeply entrenched comas. There's an institution in London known as the Nordoff Robbins Music Therapy Centre which specialises in this. They apply music and also the human voice uh, and it's been claimed that they've got autistic children to communicate for the first time. And it's also been known to, be, to bring people out of persistent comas when all else has failed. This goes some way to explain why 
favourite songs mean so much to us and all you've got to do is hear a song on the radio from years ago and you feel that tingle going up your spine, you get goosebumps on your arm, you can remember exactly where you were when the, the record came out, you can remember your emotional state at the time, it all comes flooding back to you just through listening to the arrangement of the sound frequencies in that piece of music, it's very powerful. According to this article, memories of music cannot be lost to Alzheimer's and dementia. Sorry this is so text heavy, by the way, and very wordy, but this subject doesn't really lend itself to visuals too much. Uh, so, wrapping up, if you're especially into a piece of music, your brain does something like autonomous sensory meridian response. This is from the article that we just saw which feels to you like a tingling in your brain or scalp. It's nature's own little buzz, a natural reward that is described by some as a head orgasm. According to a recently published study, the part of your brain responsible for ASMR doesn't get lost to Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's tends to put people into layers of confusion, and the study confirms that music can sometimes actually lift people out of the Alzheimer's haze and bring them back to normality, if only for a short while. It all speaks to the healing powers of music and sound. Wrapping up with another comment from the BBC. Again, would you believe it? Truth from the BBC. Who'd have credited it? Uh, this is from Radio 2's Faith in the World program they put out a few years ago, where this person, Jayadev Richardson, a session drummer, says, sound vibration is everything because the whole universe, according to Vedic literature, was created by sound. Sound is the first thing that we experience in the mother's womb, and it's the last thing that shuts down when we die. So to hear the right kind of sounds is vital. Free will choice is always present in our existence. Just as sound can be used to control and enslave us, so it could provide a gateway to the type of positive and uplifting experience we would all prefer to be having. So as with all things in life, it comes down to free will choice, our greatest gift that we're endowed by the Creator. So we have the free will choice to make better decisions as to the sounds that we take in. Many of the aspects that I've talked about today are in my two books. I think I've only got four copies left out there, but if anyone is interested in a copy, I do have them, and there's a whole lot more in there besides. Other than that, I want to thank everyone for listening. I think we're at the end of the day, and I'll finish just about on time, so thank you. <laughs> I just said to uh, Mark, I just thought that was brilliant. I just really enjoyed that. Um, okay, there's just a couple of things I forgot to mention earlier. On the Globe Light Tour, uh, there was a, a chap that was going to come with some people, and he was going to come on the Sunday, but obviously we had to cancel the Sunday for obvious reasons. Um, and the £170 that he was going to get refunded, he's actually donated, he told me to donate it to the Globe Light Tour, and I forgot to mention it earlier. Um, I'm also going to do um, just uh, five or ten minutes speakers' questions. If any of you got uh, questions uh, for the guys here, uh, that'd be something else. And uh, also tonight, we're not too sure what the speakers want to do, but we're actually either going to go to the camp and stay there, or we're going to maybe come back to Amsterdam. And obviously, I would like to think that if you guys are in Amsterdam and you want to um, attend with us, we'd like to see you and also get your thoughts on what you've seen. Um, we are still able to be in this venue for a little while, but we do have to be out. Um, soon, because they're giving us a deadline. Um, no, I mean, but also, I would like to bring uh, Didi up because I think that she needs. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs> thank you for your hard work. Yeah, I don't, I don't like to be in the spotlight. That's a hard thing. So. It was a big success, a lot of people turned up, we made a lot of friends, we had some fun today, and if you want to join tonight, who knows where we end up, it's Amsterdam, so you, you'll find out on live streams, on, on the Facebook group, I'll try to update it. If there's anything, you want to give some feedback or say something, just let me know, I've been here all day and I'm not going anywhere yet. So. Thank you all. Uh, what I was thinking is if, if anyone's got a particular question for the speaker, the speaker could come up to the lectern and maybe Dee Dee and I can go up the wings with the microphones.
No, no, but whoever's here, they can ask questions. So we got Jaron, we got Rodrigo, we got Karen, we have Paul. <laughs> so we got a few. So if anyone's got any question, I will pass you a microphone, and maybe the guys can stay up there while the question's being asked. You got a question? Okay, tell me. Uh, yes, uh, I choose, I think, uh, for, for Jerome. Jerome. <laughs> yes, uh, um, do you know, um, with all of your knowledge and all of your research, uh, do you know if anybody has ever tried to uh, contact uh, the the organization who is responsible for the Antarctic Treaty to ask them why is it uh, prohibited to travel to Antarctica because it's not clear really why they uh, put the, a travel ban there. Yeah, I don't, you know, they don't, it's not necessarily a travel ban. I mean, they just make it very, very difficult. Um, you know, you can go there if you wanted, but uh, I don't think anybody would shoot you out of the water, you know. But you can't take any extra fuel if you go down below 60 degrees. Uh, that's just completely ridiculous. Uh, because if you're going to go down and travel for any period of time, you need extra fuel. Right? Obviously, uh, a full tank for a boat would barely get you from, say, South America to the tip right there, that little fishtail that comes out of America. So uh, I don't think it's so much who would you contact, you know, it's a, it's a multi-country... Yeah, but if it's in uh, New York, uh, New York you have the UN, and it is, it is an existing organization, you check on Google, it, is, right. it, it really exists, so maybe uh, they have some people, a spokesperson or whatever, uh, maybe they could answer a simple question, why is it not allowed, why all the countries sign up to the same agreement? Right, so they would, they would tell you that it is allowed. Yeah, I mean, if, 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 I, if I went to the UN and said, hey, how come I can't go to the Antarctica? They would say, you're allowed to go. You just need to fill out this packet of paper. You need to get permission from this person. You need to get permission from this country. <coughs> so they have a way of getting around it. Now, really, that stuff's not realistic. I'm not going to be able to fill out that paperwork. I don't have the scientific credentials to, to go down there. So effectively, it is a treaty that prevents us from going there, but not, not honestly. I mean, they're not going to come out and say that. They're not going to say, oh, you're not allowed to go there. They're going to say, no, it is possible. You can go there. But here's what you need to do. Now, the question is, could we ever get something together to actually go down there and do that? I think you're talking multiple millions of dollars. Even to get a small vessel to go down there, first of all, how are you gonna, you're not going to get permission to put extra fuel on. So what are we going to go down there and do? You can't pick up food along the way. So you'd have to have all your preparations for food, for water, for gear. I don't know whose who's, who's presentation was it? You, Paul, that was talking about you can't even have, um, or was it yours? That you can't have like a motorized craft. Yours, right? Yeah, so I mean, you can go there, but you're not gonna be able to do anything when you're there. So I think the questions need to be more about why can't we take motorized craft? They're gonna tell you because it pollutes the, the area. So see what I'm saying, how there's a way out for them in every way you try and go after it? If you say, well, you know, why can't we bring a, a skidoo on there or a, uh, um, some sort of, I don't know what it would be, some sort of tractor or something, they're going to tell you it pollutes the air so that you're not allowed to do that. But they're allowed to. They, they can do all that stuff. But it, it, I think it's not right when I hear some people say, oh, the, the treaty says we can't go there. Um, in, a, in effect, the, the words of the treaty will lead you to understand you can't go there. But it's not, it's not written in a way that says you can't go there. Well, then we could just go ask, how come we're not allowed to go there? So instead, the treaty's written in a way that makes it impossible for you to go. So I, I don't know how you ask that question. They, they've effectively blocked it. Uh, I don't know how you ask the question, well, why? Because they'll tell you, oh, you can do it. Get permission from this school, this university, this scientific agency. Talk to the NSF. We don't have anything like that. The people who do are, have grants, have, you know, are with a college. They can get three or four or five teachers together and send them to a place that they call you know, Antarctica, or we don't know where it's at, some base, McMurdo, something like that, and they do science. So uh, It's a good question. I just don't think that um, that would really work. Yeah, I don't know. Thanks, Jeremy. Do you have anybody have a better answer for that one? Paul, somebody? Sorry to call you out, Paul. You should maybe a better answer. I would, I would just add one thing that I've, that I've read, and 
um, just based on reading the treaty itself, it's required that you have an environmental impact study um, completed. Um, and th those can be very, very expensive, I've heard, and again, I haven't verified this myself, but you have to, um, when you go to get permission and fill out the paperwork, you have to have this study done first to, ex to um, you're describing what you're gonna be doing, what the scientific value is, what the in impact of the environment is. You have to have a third party come and provide that study for you, and then that goes to your packet when you're paying and, and, and be doing all your planning and all that. So it, it is, like Jaron said, it's not a situation where you can't go. When you start looking at the steps that it takes, most people are gonna go, I can't do it. It's, it's not, not too feasible for me, I got too much going on. And so I think that's the point of it, it's that you look at it and go, it's, it's gonna be too difficult. That's the only thing I would add. Thank you. Packages, I guess, just to some ceremonial areas. You know, they take leaders there and they say that they're there. They go to they have a ceremonial North Pole. So, I guess some people can get there without having all the scientific uh, credentials, or I mean, a whole study to stay there for a long time. But they're just going to be there, I guess, just a short period and be completely controlled. And you don't know exactly what's your latitude. If you, is that correct to say that some, some people get there through this kind of other route? Just, just what I read online. I, I, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, there's been a lot of world leaders that have gone there at very suspicious times, but again, we're just speculating. You know, we're just we're just speculating. But I know it's very very difficult. You know, I, I want to know what's going on with the North Pole too, as well. You know, I know that there's uh, there's supposedly cruises there, just like the South Pole. And Jaron, you did a good video on uh, researching the cruises that go down to the uh, Antarctic region and how they were all connected. And you know, when you started calling and you know, looking at buying tickets and, and the plan, and there was a lot of suspicious things. So, at the end of the day, it's, you know, whatever we can find online. So, it, it's just very suspicious. No, I was just saying, Ben from Taboo Conspiracy has a great video called Antarctica is now closed, I think, or something to that effect. Sorry, we're closed? Yeah, so check out that one because he goes through and looks at all the things that are required, and, and Paul's exactly right. It's a multi-million dollar thing even to get a, an EPA study of what, what kind of damage you'd be doing according to them, uh, to the environment, and it has to be a third party. Uh, I just think there would be so much red tape, I'm not sure we could ever get there. Thanks, John. Um, if we can possibly just have uh, one more question, if anyone's got anything, because um, uh, Lisa has actually wanted to do a five minute poem, but is there anything else that anyone wants to add? Do we have a convention next year? No. <laughs> We're happy to follow your lead. <laughs> uh, at this moment, we haven't got any plans, um, but we are. You can never say never. Uh, but anyway, I just believe there's somebody up here who wants to have a word. So I, I don't need the microphone. I can use my. I can, wow. I can yeah, project my voice. Yeah, um, I, have, I have a question for everybody. By a show of hands, who believes that the Earth could be flat with a dome? Mm. Believe. The word believe. Well, no, I kind of, yeah. H hold your hand up high. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Believe it could be. All right, now put your hands down. Now, how many of you know for a fact that it has a dome over it? How many of you? Okay, my, my, I, for a fact. Well, I'm just asking for a fact. You know, because there's a big difference between believing and knowing for a fact. There's a lot of evidence that points to it. Uh, my, my, my question is very specific. Okay, my question is specific. Okay? I don't think anybody's going to say Nobody's going to say they know for a fact. No. So what I'm saying to you is, and this is based on what he said about going to the edge and seeing the dome with your own eyes. Is that what you, is that what you really need? Do That's you really, the goal. Do you really need to go see it with your own eyes? For confirmation? There's so much facts, evidence yeah. that it is. You know, yeah. I mean, now, now you know what the word freedom is. It's, it's yeah. not knowing about the dome. That's what freedom is, really is all about. So do you really want to go down that road and find out for a fact, like I do, because I went down that road, I went really oh, much further than the flat earth, okay? And once you get to that point, where do you go from there in knowing? That's my question. Yeah. That's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I'm now going to pass over to Lisa. I'm sorry there's no more time, but we didn't actually have this plan to do questions. We didn't actually have a plan to do the poll either. But anyway, over to you, Lisa. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. I wanted to share this poem in my book called The Lie of the Century. Um, the moon landing hoax and not breaking news. It's all part of the plan, folks. So let us take a review. If it's not just a show, and they're not telling porkies, then why are there shadows from various sources? Who took the first photo of Apollo 11? From the face of the moon? Use your own discretion. And why was there no dust on the landing pads? According to your trustful understanding, lads. Question the reflection on the astronaut's visor. Then under inspection, Armstrong is a liar. He was interviewed once on man's greatest achievement, along with the rest of the panel, all three gents. He looked to the right to, to recall a description, but his words weren't airtight as they point to a fiction. If you look to the left, you're recalling a memory, which really suggests it's the light of the century. The trio have been fooling the world for their club, hence traumatised Aldrin put in faces at Trump. Once again, Armstrong couldn't swear on the Bible that he went to the moon, many life for survival. Aldrin, however, upon investigation, slung a right-hander when quizzed, no hesitation. So why have experiments in a vacuum chamber put the darn astronauts in serious danger? Millionaire's moon rock has been proved to be fake. We've been taken for fools, there is little mistake. And of course, sound don't carry in no atmosphere zones. Hence, spacemen hammering heard in low tones. We must bow to these prodigies for their acclaimed milestone, achieved using technology less than a mobile phone. Then you have to wonder why they never returned and how the unfortunate blunder occurred. You know, the lost files for rocket construction, for the 200 odd mile trip and all the instructions, must be a challenger to do it again. With a budget of 19 odd billion, poor men. We must also address the Van Allen dilemma. As Kelly Smith stresses, it's a grande problema. It poses as a danger, low Earth orbits our limit. Didn't stop the moon crew though, did it? Mr. Don Petit and his joker companion could see stars from space and they said it with passion. That's funny because Armstrong saw no, saw no stars at all. This vast is far gone and we've heard enough ball. And so we can see under closer inspection, on mass inconsistencies in every direction. They're seething with lies, nothing more than mere showmen. One giant lie for mankind should be their slogan. But it does make you wonder how on earth we still marvel at the iconic picture aka the blue marble, when rockets take off at, into space at odd angles, why do we trust them when the whole thing's a scandal? I'll leave it to you guys to work out the rest. Until the next time, over and out. Peace, man. Bless. Closely, I'd just like to say a couple of things. One, thank you very much for being here. Everyone on live stream has actually been filming it or actually been um, responding uh, on the internet, which I haven't seen, I've got to be honest. Um, sorry once again to the speakers that we had to cut short. That was really bad, but because we had to go from a uh, weekend to just a Saturday, I apologise. And the final point I want to leave is instead of the term living the dream, I think that we've over the years been sold lying the dream. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you.